So hello everyone, um, and I would like to tell you how Targonomics is involved in target deconvolution um, in the agrochemical sector. And so I'd like to start off with an introduction to agrochemicals. The global population stands at 7.7 .7 billion people and is set to rise to 9.7 billion by 2050. So um, clearly there is um, a need to increase productivity of um, the fertile land that we have devoted to agriculture, um, which is required to produce these four categories um, of crops for food, feed, fiber, and fuel. And current strategies to maximize yield are dependent on crop protection chemicals. And so there are various categories of pests that can uh, have a negative impact on crop yield. Um, these include weeds. Um, of course, they are non-crop plants that compete for resources like sunlight and nutrients. There are animals like insects and also nematodes. And then like humans, plants are subject to diseases caused by different things like fungi, bacteria and viruses. And so there are existing, um, of course, um, crop protection compounds. And it's estimated that if we didn't use those at the rate that we do, um, at the moment, we would have a 50% lower output in agriculture. However, it's also estimated that we still experience losses in the field, um, in storage and during transportation that mean we could theoretically achieve 170% of the yield that we current, currently have. Um, and so clearly there's a need for innovation in the crop protection area. Um, and an important point that I'd like to come back to later is resistance to current crop protection compounds and how um, that is a problem and something that needs to be addressed. So another important aspect of agrochemicals is that, well, they, they have to be lethal, preferably at a very low dose to the pest organism, but they also have to be safe. And this is very important. And this is, they are subject to stringent regulation. So they need to be safe for people. Those are farm workers and the consumers of the uh, food produce. And they also be, need to be safe for the environment, for example, non-pest insects or aquatic life. And this presents a challenge actually within the sector because um, in terms of target deconvolution, we need to understand what is the target of the compound in the pest, but also um, what is the fate of the compound in mammals and insects and so on. And so I thought it hoped it would be um, relevant to give a little um, sort of side by side comparison of some features of agrochemicals and pharmaceuticals. So to start off with, um, you can see here there are in the top panel crop protection compounds and in the bottom panel drugs. There are three pairs of very similar compounds. And you can see that actually there, there's a reason that they're similar. Um, First of all, um, mesotrione, so that is a herbicide. It targets plant HPPD, and then nitizinone is uh, a human drug, and that also targets the same enzyme, the, the homologous um, protein in humans. Um, actually, uh, azulam and sulfanilamide both target DHPS, one in plants, so azulam is another herbicide, and uh, sulfanilamide um, is an antibiotic. And then because fungi can infect both plants and humans, you can expect some overlap in terms of um, uh, antifungal chemistry between agrochemicals and pharmaceuticals. And so azoconazole and fluconazole are rather similar. There are some differences though. So um, within 
agrochemistry, compounds ideally need to be relatively simple. The synthesis should be short, simple, um, and cost is an important factor because you need to produce very large quantities of the material. Um, and also, whereas um, in terms of medicines, a higher cost can be tolerated, medicines will be paid for sometimes by the government or uh, a health insurance company, whereas the burden of paying for the agrochemical lies with the individual farmer. So for example, you would tend not to have uh, elaborate synthetic schemes for agrochemicals with introduction of chiral centers. Of course, there are some differences in terms of modality. So in uh, agrochemicals are dominated by small molecule organic compounds, whereas increasingly in uh, pharmaceuticals, um, we see uh, a lot of biologics, um, antibodies, peptides, nucleic acids. And finally, to come back to the fact that there are, there's nothing intrinsically different um, between these two classes of compounds. Actually, there are some no examples of known crop protection compounds that are that have the potential to act as medicines in human diseases such as malaria, cancer, hypertension, and heart disease. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus on herbicides. Um, and so if you want to develop a new herbicide, there are a couple of approaches you might take. And um, one would be uh, similar to what is often used for medicines. So that would be a target-based screen. So in that case, you've chosen a protein that you'd like to target to begin with. You might want to inhibit an enzyme. You might want to bind a receptor and cause a signal. You might want to disrupt a protein-protein interaction. So you'll do an in vitro screen with uh, a, a lot of um, a variety of chemistry, and you'll look for hits in vitro that might be binders or inhibitors. Then you need to go on to an important step, phenotypic validation. And this is where you can see a high attrition rate. So for example, it may be that although you have binding in vitro, actually when you apply the compound to a, a plant, so a, a model organism for a weed, that actually it does, the compound doesn't have a herbicidal effect. Um, if it does, then you can go on and develop it to make a new herbicide. But what's actually more common in the agrochemical sector for, for, for in, a, in terms of herbicide development, you have the luxury of being able to do phenotypic screens because you can grow plants, you can grow seedlings, you can apply compounds at, in, in a high throughput way to seedlings and actually find hits that you know from the beginning have a herbicidal effect. But then the major challenge is this part. This is target elucidation. You want to find out how is that compound having an effect in the plant and you need to find out which protein is being targeted as, as, as part of developing your herbicide. So this is where Targonomics comes in. So Targonomics is a company that elucidates the molecular target of bioactive compounds with a focus on agrochemicals and much of our work is on um, herbicides themselves. So what is the uh, how, how idea? How does Targonomics work? Uh, so essentially, the idea is to record an, a, a, a large number of different data sets, large data sets, and then use computational biology to analyze the data and um, come up with generate hypotheses for um, target and then um, uh, confirm what the target is. So for example, the um, several omics technologies are used, transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics. Also, a number of different advanced digital imaging technologies are used. These um, image cells and also phenotype whole plants. And all of that is done um, in combination, in parallel with classical approaches such as genetics, biochemistry and molecular biology. So just to give you a little flavor of how we go about 
generating hypotheses. So I've got one omics example and one non-omics example. So for example, um, with metabolomics, this is systems biology. So you are record recording, this is, I've got a very simple cartoon here just with five metabolites plotted, but you will actually be recording all the metabolites you can detect um, within your system and comparing the plant growing on its own and the plant that's been treated with the compound. And then you look at the difference and you find out that, okay, for many of the metabolites, there's uh, no effect of applying the compound, but you see that one is increasing. And so, okay, that tells you, okay, perhaps this is the substrate of the target. If you're in a, a biosynthetic pathway and the target is blocked, then its substrate will accumulate. So that can give you a clue. Alternatively, you can do a simple um, classical genetics approach, whereby you take a large library of mutagenized plants and you grow them in the presence of the compound. So if you grow the wild type plant in the presence of your herbicide, then it, it, will, um, it, won't, it won't grow. But you will find some by chance, some mutants that are able to grow even in the presence of the compound, you then um, sequence their genomes and um, uh, converge on uh, a, a, an idea of what the target might be. So this is the targetomics pipeline. You can see we've got a uh, uh, several different workflows. Um, they contribute to hypothesis generation. And then um, there are other workflows that contribute to validation of the hypothesis on the way to determining the target. And as I mentioned, bioinformatics approaches are used to analyze all the data together and intersect data coming from different approaches, uh, di different um, workflows. And in fact, an important point here is that apart from um, the compounds of unknown target that we are analyzing, we have passed a large number of marker compounds through the pipeline. And that means that we have uh, a very nice large data set. So we know what the signature in terms of the transcriptome or, or the phenotype or whatever it might be of um, a compound that targets one particular um, enzyme in the plant. We know what that looks like. And so then when we get our unknown target, we can uh, a compound with an unknown target, we can uh, do a comparison and that can help. We're also a, um, a young company, a startup, a small company. We're based in Potsdam in Germany and um, we are research oriented and we're able to integrate new sources of data into the different workflows and also um, add new workflows um, when required. And so recently, actually, we have added this new workflow, chemical informatics, um, and that is what I'd like to continue to talk to you about um, and explain um, how we are starting to use computational chemistry in this area. And so coming back to resistance, this is uh, something very important. Um, it's important, I mean, it's important for antibiotics, but in terms of agrochemicals, it's important across different classes of crop production compounds and certainly it's important for herbicides. So um, obviously when you're applying a herbicidal compound to a field, you are applying a selection pressure and evolution will uh, go on as normal and uh, at, at the, you know the more you apply a particular compound uh, that addresses a particular target the, the the more likely you are to observe resistance and these are the different targets known targets and mechanisms of herbicides and the really important point to note is that if you take into account both monocots and dicots, at least one of them, and you look globally, somewhere in the world, resistance has developed to compounds within all of these herbicide classes. And so what that means is that within this sector, if you can come up with a herbicide, a new herbicide that has a new target, that is really um, absolutely, the ability to do that is at a premium. And then this is just to highlight that later on, um, I, would, I will be focusing on three classes of herbicides um, for the ligand to ligand uh, approach, ALS and ACCAs, and then for the ligand to protein structure approach, 
PPO. Okay, so um, essentially the rest of the talk um, is split into two parts, ligand, ligand, and ligand protein structure. So what we wanted to do was see if we could use um, chemical similarity to help us understand what the target of uh, a new compound might be. And essentially, this is, the idea is to simplify the target deconvolution problem. And instead of asking, what is the target of the compound in the plant? Ask simply, is the target in the plant likely either to be a target that is already known as a herbicide target or a, a new target? And as I've just mentioned, the reason is, if you get a clue it's going to be a new target, then that is a kind of chemistry that you would really like to focus on optimizing. And so the idea really um, is to, as I said, use chemical similarity. So um, briefly, um, it's possible to um, represent chemicals in uh, a variety of different ways and for computational analysis, a, a convenient way to do it is via a 2D fingerprint or a, a bit string. And there are many different varieties of these. Um, and essentially they, um, yeah, they are a way to represent the molecule, which are, um, when you form these fingerprints, then comparison of pairs of fingerprints is very fast and convenient computationally. And so for this part, as I mentioned, uh, I'll talk about ALS and ACCA's herbicides. Um, these are herbicides which target um, enzymes that are important for the plant because ALS is involved in synthesis of branched chain amino acids. And ACCA's is involved in um, synthesis of lipids. Uh, I've just got a, a, a short section of the overall pathway shown here. So essentially what I'll discuss um, is some work that is sort of um, um, uh, preliminary work and it's simply using publicly known herbicides. And so essentially the idea is to compare the chemical structures of different herbicide chemotypes and see how similar they are. And in particular, so for on the left, there are two chemotypes of herbicides. So these are both ALS herbicides. They have the same target. These are sulfonylureas and triazolopyrimidines. I've just given them silly short names to make it easy. So these are ALS RONs and ALS LAMs. So then on the right, these are ACCA's herbicides. Again, there are two chemotypes Araloxy phenoxy propionates and cyclohexane dienes. So simply ACCA's FOPs and ACCA's DIMs. Um, and essentially the idea was to compare these different chemotypes and see can we say something sensible um, about them just based on the chemical structure. So are ALS RONs more similar to ALS LAMs because they have the same target than they are to the ACCA's FOPs? and the ACCA's DIMS. Um, and so comparison was done um, of RONs to themselves and then to the three other chemotypes. This can conveniently be done in a NIME workflow, um, just in case anyone is not familiar with NIME. Um, it is a, a, an environment that allows you simply to handle and process data um, by dragging and dropping nodes, each of which performs uh, a script, and then linking the nodes and, 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 and rapidly um, creating workflows. So this is a simple workflow to do this analysis where um, different chemotypes are fed in, they are read, a fingerprint is created, and then the, the, the fingerprints are compared. And so just to explain how so I've got several plots that look like this. So this is a comparison of RONs to RONs. So for one particular data point, this is amidosulfuron 
and it has been compared in a pairwise way to all of the other ROMs. And then what's plotted is the average value of that similarity for that one compound. So each of these is a single compound. And absolutely no surprise, the, this is one chemotype and the compounds within it are reasonably similar to one another. Then comparing RONs to LAM, so these both have ALS as their target. Again, the um, similarity is reasonably high. It's, a, it's on average a bit lower, but it's still higher. So then the interesting thing is how does the comparison look with the similarity to the other uh, herbicides with a different target? And interestingly, um, it, uh, they, they, these uh, FOPs and the DIMs do give a lower similarity. And so essentially the idea would be um, very simplistically, you could um, apply a threshold here um, below which compounds are of a different um, herbicidal target and above which they are of the same target. So the idea would be if, for example, no RONs were known to begin with and one came into our pipeline, we would do the similarity and say, okay, um, it looks more similar to LAMs than it does to FOPs and DIMs. So perhaps it is just based on its chemical structure, um, an ALS herbicide. That would be the idea. So then um, having explained how that's all working, this is now from the LAMs perspective. There are fewer compounds here. There are only seven compounds in this chemotype. Again, reasonably similar self to self, a little bit less similar, but still um, uh, above a threshold we might um, draw to the other chemotype and then for the FOPs and DIMs that have the ACCAs as their target, again, you could apply a threshold and you could call whether um, the herbicide was ALS or ACCAs. So then a um, um, more interesting sort of thing would be if you were to carry on, you could include in your analysis a different um, chemotype that is also an ALS herbicide. So I've got a couple of um, compounds here. They are flucarbazone sodium and propoxycarbazone sodium. So these are in a different chemotype. Um, they are, but they are to the first two that we looked at, but they are ALS herbicides. And you can see that again, for this third chemotype, the similarity to LAMs and RONs, the ALSs, is higher and the similarity of the, the FOPs and DIMs is lower. So again, you could apply a threshold and call correctly that these are ALS herbicides. Then um, thinking about uh, Im imagining you have a, a different kind of herbicide that doesn't have a target of either ALS or ACCA, so glyphosate. So that has a different target, EPSP. So if that compound came into the classifier, what would you see? Actually, you would see a rather low similarity to all of these chemotypes. So if you applied your um, threshold somewhere in the middle, then you would say it is neither um, an ALS nor an ACCA. So that would be the point at which you would want to say, um, okay, this is a, a compound that's interesting to um, develop. So this is a very um, uh, limited initial analysis and the idea would be to extend it to all of those known herbicide categories. Um, then this is just, one more example, and this is from the ACCA's perspective, um, how does it perform? This was interesting to see that the FOPs themselves, amongst themselves, the similarity is um, rather less. So in other words, the chemical space covered within that one chemotype is rather broader. And then you can see in this case, actually the DIMs, which are also ACCA's herbicides, the similarity is lower and in fact you can't distinguish the other chemotype that isn't ACCAs with the ALS chemotypes. So clearly in this case you're, you wouldn't be able to apply a threshold to make correct calls and then the same thing applies from the DIMS perspective as the other ACCAs chemotype. Again um, they have a higher similarity amongst themselves but going to the other chemotype um, that drops and is not distinguishable from the ALS. So in other words, um, what this tells us is that as what you can imagine that um, some receptors, some protein receptors may be able to accommodate a wider variety of chemistry. Um, and as such, this sort of approach that is purely based on the ligand chemical structure um, will, will 
not be so successful. Um, so clearly you may have some differences in how well it works from um, uh, one receptor to another. But we would like to expand this analysis to all of the known herbicide classes. So then moving on to ligand protein structure work. Actually here, I mean, it's obvious to say that um, at the target validation stage of our pipeline, when we have a, a relatively uh, short list of possible targets, then um, absolutely um, ligand protein docking will be something useful that we can use to assess um, the and, and rank the likelihood of um, the targets on the shortlist being the, the genuine target. But it's also something we could use at the earlier stage um, and we could use it to try and answer that question I posed before. Is uh, a compound of unknown target, does it have a target that is unknown amongst herbicides, existing herbicides? So for this work, um, uh, we've looked at PPO, um, but actually you can imagine um, doing what I show now um, for all the existing herbicide targets, having a panel of protein structures ready to be docked into. Um, and so you could try to answer the question on the previous slide. So PPO is another enzyme that is um, important for plants and is a existing herbicide target. And it's involved in porphyrin biosynthesis. And so that's important for formation of chlorophyll and also for heme. And so actually PPO, um, it sits in a complex, it's thought to sit in a complex with the upstream enzyme copropoporphyrinogen 3 oxidase and either magnesium chelatase or iron chelatase, depending on which iron is going to be inserted. Um, and it's thought that the substrate can pass down a channel. Um, so you're going to start outside in the cytoplasm, pass through the outer membrane of your um, chloroplast or mitochondrion, come to PPO, go on to the um, metal chelatase and then exit into the inner membrane um, of the organelle. And so this is the enzyme that, this is the reaction that PPO is going to do. It's going to oxidize protoporphyrinogen 9 um, using three oxygen molecules. And the reason that this is actually um, uh, inhibiting this enzyme is uh, a herbicidal mechanism is that if you inhibit the enzyme, this species actually accumulates in the cytoplasm. And because it's rather reactive, it is oxidized anyway, but in an uncontrolled manner, um, not by the enzyme and then channeled into this membrane um, and reactive oxygen species are produced. Uh, lipid head groups are oxidized and um, membranes are disrupted. And, and this is actually rather a rapid um, way to cause um, death in a plant. And then this is just to highlight the fact, um, to essentially to draw attention to the structure of the substrate with, because we're now going to go on to look at PPO herbicides and PPO herbicides, you can think of them as something a little bit like half a substrate molecule. So just keep these two rings um, with a bridging atom in mind. So here are four categories of PPO herbicide. Um, essentially, you, 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 you generally have, you, you always have in PPO herbicides, two rings. They may have a bridging atom. So that would commonly be an oxygen in the diphenyl ethers, which is the largest, um, has the largest number of compounds in it as a chemotype. Rarely it's a nitrogen. Um, alternatively, you can have um, a bond directly between the two rings. Um, this lower right ring is almost always six membered, um, but the, the, the upper left can be five or six membered. And um, an interesting thing, and we'll look at this in the context of the um, binding pocket in the protein, is that the substitution patterns that are permitted 
within these uh, compounds that have this activity. And so generally, you have some level of substitution, some limited substitution on these two sides of the rings. Um, and there's one position in particular here um, where actually longer chains can be accommodated. So this is just a list of, again, publicly known herbicides uh, that target PPO. And while I think of it, I should just make the point, and this goes for the ligand ligand and also the ligand protein structure analysis, that of course, um, the conclusions you make uh, using these computational chemistry approaches, they depend on the same binding site within the enzyme being involved. So clearly, the you know if you have uh, an allosteric site um, for, in an enzyme, then uh, the chemistry that is you know that that binds to that site, um, you would expect to be quite different from that which binds to the the active site itself. So then moving on to the protein. Uh, so this is um, a structure. A PP, there are several PPO structures in the PDB. Um, this is from tobacco. There are also a couple of bacterial structures and some human structures as well. And so essentially you have three domains. This is an FAD dependent enzyme. So up here in darker blue, you have an FAD binding domain and FAD is bound uh, down in a, in a channel down here. This is the substrate binding domain. And here, this um, is a, a crystal structure that has uh, an inhibitor small molecule bound in the active site. And then there's a, a third domain, which is involved in interaction with lipids. And so zooming in a little bit um, at the active site, effectively, essentially the um, architecture is determined um, to a large extent by four key residues within the protein. So there are two pairs of residues which sit above and below each of the rings in the small molecule and they um, make a sandwich. So for instance here you can see a phenylalanine in the tobacco structure. It doesn't have to be aromatic. Um, in human, you can see a methionine here. And then underneath, you have the carbonyl, backbone carbonyl of a glycine. And so those two residues sit above and below the five-membered ring here. Then you have uh, in tobacco, a leucine and another leucine, and they are sitting above and below this second ring. And so that those really are important determinants of the binding. And the interesting thing is the, the binding site is rather narrow and hydrophobic, um, and there isn't much in the way of hydrogen bond potential you know, for donor or acceptors. There is an arginine at one end. And so here you can clearly see, um, here you have fluazolate, uh, the free acid version of it, and here you have acyfluorphen. Um, so in both these cases, there is in the small molecule, a hydrogen bond acceptor that's able to interact with the arginine, um, but otherwise uh, the site is rather hydrophobic. And the interesting thing is here in this human structure, you can see that when you have a diphenyl ether, there's a slightly different angle um, between, uh, a considerably different angle between the two rings as compared to the left structure. And in this case, uh, a phenylalanine, which is flipped out in tobacco is flipped in and um, forms an interaction with this second ring. And then here, this is just showing the relatively narrow groove um, and the um, ability, well, effect, effectively that there are some gaps which can be filled by um, substitution, a, a small amount of substitution on the far side of the molecule. So um, simply the idea was to um, do a docking enrichment analysis um, and see if this could be um, a useful way to try to understand whether a compound with an unknown target may be uh, a PPO binder. And so essentially this was done using the um, public uh, tobacco PPO2 um, protein structure and then the uh, a list of public herbicides from all the 
um, categories shown in the table earlier. Of course, there are some steps that you need to do to prepare your protein and your small molecule for docking. Um, and then simply each molecule in turn was docked into the protein, a model was generated, and then the models were scored. And at the end, you get a table with uh, a, a ranking of your compounds. And so here, this is uh, not intended to be legible, but the whole table is shown here. So this is sort of, you know, 300 uh, and more um, known herbicides. But the point is that highlighted in red are small molecules which are known to be PPO binders. And so you can see a reasonably good enrichment of PPO binders uh, close to the top of the table. Um, so for example, if you take, I mean, it's compared to normal virtual screening, this is rather a small number, 330 or so um, compounds, um, and there are around 30 PPO inhibitors. So you would need to cut at 10% to have space to fit all of them in. If you do cut at 10%, then you um, recover about 75% of your known PPO um, binders also in this top part of the table. So that seems to be working reasonably well in this case. And um, of course, the idea would be if you have your new compound, um, you dock it into PPO and you see where in the table does it appear? Does it appear somewhere in this top part of the table? And therefore, can you get a clue um, uh, using the structural protein structural information available, um, whether it might be a PPO compound. Of course, um, computational methods give you can give you an indication but are never definitive. And you would always want to do an experiment. So um, having done this, we are um, currently recording SPR data on known PPO compounds and one or two other compounds of interest such as compounds near the top of the table which are supposed to have a different target, and then compounds near the bottom of the table, which are supposed to have a different target as sort of uh, some different sort of controls. Um, and so we're going to record some experimental data and see how those compare with the in silico results. And the previous figures that I showed were actual structures. These are models. Um, but the encouraging thing is that um, this is just uh, a couple of the more than 300 poses of all the different compounds. Um, and the encouraging thing you can see here for fluazolate and saflufenacil is that actually the docking has recapitulated nicely as expected the binding mode of these sorts of compounds with the, the two rings sandwiched between um, the, the pair of protein residues. And the interesting thing is that from the docking, you can actually get a further insight into the binding mode. And here we can see, actually, because these two um, small molecules do have a rather longer chain um, extending from this ring. And actually, we can see how that can be accommodated. So this is actually the groove that the substrate is thought to diffuse down towards the next enzyme. Um, the chelatase enzyme. And so you can see how an inhibitor can start to fill in that groove and put some uh, hydrophobic um, moiety um, in this depression here in the in the alpha helix. So that gives you a, a further insight into um, possible binding modes. So um, I've come to the end of the presentation now. So really, I would just like to summarize um, and say that I've tried to explain how targonomics um, works in the deconvolution of, of the target of small molecules in the agrochemical sector. Um, targonomics is using uh, a systems biology interdisciplinary approach. Um, and um, I've also showed some examples of how um, we are thinking about trying to integrate uh, computational chemistry techniques into that um, interdisciplinary approach. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you've got.